And I promise you, most hunters in America, if they saw this on a three-year-old body, they would shoot it and pat themselves on the back. You know, man, I'm glad I got that crappy thing out of our deer herd. Man, I don't want that thing breeding back on our does. Well, I can tell you that he only damaged his velvet during the early growth period of that year. And uh, I'll find his antlers here shortly. And if you had harvested that deer at three and a half, you would have missed out on him at four and a half. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, uh, you know, he was a, a perfectly symmetrical four and a half year old animal, scored uh, 142 Boone and Crockett gross in that but i think just the next logical step would be to talk about the broad influences of age nutrition and genetics the big three as we call them they've always been the big three they'll always be the same big three and and carl you might want to dive in there of how you would rank them you know in terms of importance in a free-ranging we always have to define our terms in a free-ranging situation all right well i mean it's pretty clear in the way we've been talking it's pretty clear that number one is always going to be age a yearling buck is just not going to grow a, a great set of antlers. They're not going to reach their maximum or their peak antler uh, configuration till four and a half, five and a half, six and a half years old. And it may vary a little bit dependent on the part of the country you're in, on the quality of the habitat. You know, you go to South Texas, it might be a little bit delayed, and it might be in, under the influence of uh, environmental conditions down there. On really great habitat, you can grow some phenomenal deer at four and a half, five and a half years old. But once you reach that peak, at four and a half, five and a half, subsequent years, they t don't tend to add much at all. Now, again, there's variation. Some may get bigger at seven, eight years old. We've had deer in the deer pens that just kind of exploded around seven years old. Uh, but, you know, it, it, in the norm, it's going to be somewhere in the, the five and a half, six and a half year old is where they're going to reach their peak. And the only thing you can do to, to manage for that is keep your finger off the trigger, you know? Mm. That's very simple to manage for age structure. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, nutrition, I would rank second in the, in a free ranging situation. A lot of people want to talk genetics, uh, first and certainly genetics. If you're in a high fence, if you're on an Island, if you're in a deer pen, you know, those are different situations. You can control more, more aspects and while we can't, uh, nutrition is often limiting. Uh, a lot of people have quote food plots, but if you really look at it, you know, on a landscape level, it's quarter acre scratched out, poorly done, you know, a patch of something to kill them over not really nutritional uh you know uh, investment much in the deer herd or a lot of people focus on native vegetation of course so so nutrition is key and, and most hunters when they think when i if i pitch a uh, how do you help deer nutrition almost all of them would say what can i feed them you know deer feed or food plot or native native vegetation i mean there'll be a lot of good answers one i'll almost never hear and it's often the most important depending on where you are is density management controlling the number of deer because that does more for your deer nutrition than almost anything else you can do. Because if you don't have enough groceries for the deer herd you have, the best thing you can do is take mouths off that range. Uh, and, and you typically can't prop it up with enough sacks of deer feed if it's just too high. Um, each deer, on average, consumes about one ton of dry matter weight per year per animal. Okay, so The average food plot might produce a ton per acre you know, uh, of forage if you do, do it well. But you're talking about, you know, it takes a lot of food plots to feed 20 deer, let alone 60, 80, 100 deer. So, so nutrition is really key. And genetics is really where a lot of want, hunters want to uh, focus because that opens up the opportunity for, quote, cull bucks. And the whole discussion, the feel-good stuff. I shot a buck and needed to get out of the gene pool, okay? <laughs> How many times have we heard that, right? Oh, yeah. All you got to do is listen to a TV show uh, and watch them. Had to get that ratty deer out of my deer herd to help my genetics. Yeah. Okay. Before, we, before we get you too fired up on the genetics aspect of it, let's get back to the nutrition because that yeah. is that is beyond age. That is critical. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, actually King Edward in the 14th century. His huntsman was the first one to really document this. He said the head grows according to the pasture and otherwise, which means you know as good as the you know the better you can have the habitat out there, the better the head's going to be on that. And he was basically the first quality deer manager, the first trophy manager back there in the 14th century. So we've known this for a long time. And, uh, you know, so having your habitat in good shape, having your density relative to the habitat and that habitat's capability, which is going to vary in different parts of the country as well. The soil is going to drive a lot of that. In areas where you've got good quality soils and good growing conditions, you're going to grow better quality animals mm. than any if you don't have good soils in sandy ridge areas or in you know south along the coastal plain in georgia alabama south carolina you just don't grow a lot of trophy animals because the soil conditions aren't good enough for them but consider that compared to the upper midwest you know 
part of that is genetics. They have you know different subspecies. But look at Georgia. Georgia's been stock, stocked with subspecies from all over the country, and you know we we grow some good deer, but we grow those good deer in areas where we've got good habitat. Mm. We've got good agricultural land. We've got good agricultural land because the soil is good there. So the deer have a you know plenty to eat. They're allowed nutritionally to reach their genetic potential. Mm-hmm. It, that you brought up an interesting little rabbit hole that I like to go down. A lot of hunters, um, George is a great example. We kill some of our biggest deer in Metro Atlanta, right? Mm-hmm. You know, 180 inch deer coming out of DeKalb County, Fulton County, and a lot of people go, "Wow, why?" Are, well, and, and the same's true around St. Louis, Missouri, and you, a lot of these major metropolitan areas have big deer. And a lot of people think, "Well, it's just because they're eating, you know, lush, lush gardens out of people's backyards," and that's part of it. Part of it's because they get old, can get old sometimes. But a big part of it is because the soils are better there. If you look at where humans build our big cities, they're typically in riverine systems with good agriculture soils around them because they need water and they need to grow crops. So a lot of our cities are situated in very good deer habitat because they're good human habitat. Okay, So, so don't ever overlook the fact of good soils and, and, and good productivity being in where big cities are. So it's not the city factor by itself. It's also the dirt that the city sits on that's real important there. It's a good point. So let's get into genetics uh, real quick here. Um, and I think this is a, a, a good starting point. The set of antlers I've got here off this deer. This was a University of Georgia deer that I know well, so I know everything that happened to him. It was a, a three-year-old animal. And I promise you, most hunters in America, if they saw this on a three-year-old body, they would shoot it and pat themselves on the back. You know, man, I'm glad I got that crappy thing out of our deer herd. Man, I don't want that thing breeding back on our does. Well, I can tell you that he only damaged his velvet during the early growth period of that year. And uh, I'll find his antlers here shortly. And if you had harvested that deer at three and a half, you would have missed out on him at four and a half. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, uh, you know, he was a, a per- here, here, back, back yeah, up. Back up. Yeah, there so you go. He was a, a perfectly <laughs> symmetrical four and a half year old animal, scored uh, 142 Boone and Crockett gross inches just because he damaged his velvet the previous year. And so what I tell people is when it comes to <clears throat> to velvet injuries, which is the most common type of injury, is something that happens during the, the antler growing time of the year. What happens in velvet stays in velvet, okay? It's just like Vegas. So if it, if it occurs during the velvet stage, it's that year's effect only. So what, what the, the rule we use on our hunting farm, and I recommend it, uh, as a minimum, as we call it the two-strike rule. Not a three-strike rule, two-strike rule. If we see a deer repeat the same thing two consecutive years, then it becomes eligible for a management removal if, if we see it and want, want to take it. A one-off year observation on a deer is not normally enough to, to know what caused it and to, to know whether it's going to be permanent or not. There are a couple of exceptions to that rule. Uh, this is a... Uh, a, a, a buck that I shot oh, 30 years ago, and you can see that it's got a, a, what you'd say is a normal antler uh, on its right side and an abnormal antler on the left. And when I saw this buck, I immediately knew why this opposite antler was, was deformed. It was missing 11 inches of its opposite back leg. Okay, So we call it a contralateral deformity. It's very common, almost 100% of the time that a deer's severely injured on a rear leg, it'll affect the opposite antler contralateral deformity um, and it's permanent so if you see a deer that's missing a leg or got a deformed leg or carrying it and it's got a deformed antler on the opposite side you can remove that animal if you want it's not genetics he can't pass this on <laughs> all right he was hit by a car whatever it was uh, shot by a gun so I removed him because he was not going to meet our management objective and he was going to eat food and just be a wasted animal for our management goals I had no genetic improvement goal out of him um, the opposite occurs interestingly enough and here's another opposite leg injury and they often have this um squiggly sort of misshapen antler on the offside and and some researchers suppose that it's for balance i don't know that we really know why that is and exactly why the opposite effect on a rear leg uh you know we're cross-wired our central nervous systems left brain right body we think that's largely how this this phenomenon occurs however what's interesting is that uh with a, I don't know if I can got it here. That's a pedicle. Anyway, with a saint with a front leg injury, we typically see the same antler deformed. Sometimes both. So it's it's not near the pattern isn't as consistent with a front leg injury. You know, a front uh, a front leg. So that's you know one of the most common causes would be 
you know, something happening during the, the antler growth time of the year, like the, the buck uh, said here, very early in the, in the velvet stage. And what happens is the earlier in the velvet growth the injury to that pedicle occurs or that antler, the more profound the outcome. And just think about it, right? So if a deer's only got this much velvet growth and something bad happens to those soft velvety stumps, a lot of weird things can happen. If he's 80% done in late June and he damages a little bit, eh, it's only so much that could go wrong at that point. So the earlier in the growth phase, the more profound the potential outcome, good or bad. Right. Okay. So what you're kind of seeing, and Brian's getting into, and he's going to you know, go beyond this, is that most abnormal antlers that you see out there are related to some type of injury to that animal. Whether it's an, uh, an injury to the in velvet, which will not be there the subsequent years, or an injury to the body that will be there in subsequent years. But culling a deer because of it, you got to understand the reason why that deer has an abnormal antler. Because if it's a somatic injury to the body, that deer can be taken out of there. If it's an injury to the growing antlers, give that deer the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always, always kind of have a checklist with um, the least likely being a genetic cause. In, mo in most parts of the whitetails range, genetics is the least common cause of, it's generally an injury to the body, as we've discussed, leg injuries. A very common one also is a pedicle injury, the pedicle itself. And that can happen during shedding of antler, uh, shedding of the antler or, or during fighting. And, and every hunter's seen it if you picked up any shed antlers. Every now and then you'll find one with a little fragment of the pedicle, right? A piece of the, in fact, we had an antler tree at the QDMA office and we actually analyzed it. And 15% of the antlers had a piece of the pedicle stuck on them. And that broken pedicle can relate, can cause an abnormal antler on that opposite side. So a lot of pedicle breakage may explain where we get pockets of this in Alabama, Mississippi. We see pockets of this disproportionately across the Whitetails range. And so I was bringing that up to you earlier. One of my uncle's leases 15 years ago, it was a very common trait of pretty much all the deer, no matter the age, I mean, two and a half or older, where one side was like a big spike or like a split tie, a split beam, whatever, and then the other side was a, a, a good side. Um, and it, it was one of those things, they kept talking about like the genetic, you know, kept saying genetic aspect, just like that deer, absolutely. Yep. And it... You know, I, I think, like you said, there's there's areas where you see people talk about that on social media that, like, you know, their farm sets up where they just have a lot of that kind of characteristic. And is that, again, you were saying more so in some areas potentially? We see, we see pockets of it. We don't fully understand why in Alabama, Mississippi, the Deep South, that part of the Deep South, we see a lot more one-antler deer. Um, probably some, I hate to throw that genetic word in because everybody wants to anchor it. It could be something as simple as there's some nutritional deficiency in the way the pedicle forms. I mean, it could be a, a, some other environmental c condition other than genetics. But it, it does seem to be very localized in some areas, particularly mm -hmm. Alabama. Yeah. And yeah. given the number of, numbers of them, the proportion of them in the population, it seems that there has to be something hereditary I, I, there. Th I, I, would, I would lean that way, too. But uh, there, are, there are a number of other things that can cause that same type of deformity. Well, I think, I think a good wrap-up to this... Uh, genetics discussions, I know we'll probably run a little short on time, is to conclude with the research. All right, let's, just, let's assume a best case scenario here. We can pick the genetic culls out of this pile of, 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 uh, of, of antler deformities. Pick only those that have bad genetics, mm -hmm. right? Can we cull that out of a herd and removing them? Does it matter in a wild situation? So the best research done in Texas, uh, in fact, started on the, on the famed King Ranch. I was part of that. Carl was part of that. Uh, they took two 10,000-acre sections of the King Ranch. It's a big place. <laughs> two small pastures, 10,000 acres each. And on one 10,000-acre area, they culled intensively, every age class. They had strict criteria. If you were a year and a half, you, you know, if you were a spike or three points, you were gone. If you were two and a half, if you didn't have at least six points, you were gone. If you were three and a half and older, eight points, you know. They, and they did it with a level of precision that no hunting club in America could do. So they have trained guides. They even used helicopters and net guns. And, and, and assessed them on the ground in some cases and either euthanized them or let them go. So, I mean, this was a level of sophistication. You know, can culling improve genetics in a free-ranging deer herd? So they had one 10,000-acre treatment area, culled intensively, removed 157 bucks over seven seasons. This adjoining 10,000-acre pasture, no cull bucks removed. After the end of that seven years, they come in with helicopter net gun crews, and in that habitat, you can catch 100 bucks a day. So, I mean, you can catch a lot of bucks, right? So, we, they were able to catch almost every buck on, on both of those areas, or high enough percentage. And then they compared antlers to antlers, age for age. 
How does one and a half compare? Two and a half, three and a half, four and a half. And they found exactly no difference. <laughs> um, and in fact, the antlers on the cold area were slightly smaller, not, not statistically significant, but they made zero difference. So the researchers said, well, that's great. That's 10,000 acre scale, seven years. Maybe the scale and the, the duration wasn't big enough to see the effect. So they moved it into uh, a, a, a confined situation. And Dr. Uh, Donnie Drager uh, with the Texas A&M Kingsville did this research for years. And they were able to control it and, and really, really look at this on a small scale and repeat it season after season after season. In a high-fenced area. In a high-fenced, yeah, controlled, high-fenced, smaller pen situation with different treatment, different culling regimes. And they found that by culling these bad deer, quote, so-called bad deer, out, they eventually ran out of deer <laughs> before they saw an effect. Uh, so they, even in a controlled environment. So what does all this mean? That if you're... If your justification for removing a buck on your property is to improve genetics, you're absolutely fooling yourself. Period. Okay. If you're it, even if it is genetic based, now, does that mean that some of these deer shouldn't be removed for management purposes? No, absolutely. There are many of these deer that were shot very purposely for management reasons. They're not going to produce the antlers we want. They're going to consume feed and resources, maybe bully some other bucks off our property. So there's there are very legitimate reasons to shoot bucks with misshapen antlers. But don't fool yourself into believing it's all genetics or that even if it is genetics, that it's going to make a difference in a free-ranging gene flow. Gene flow across the whitetails range is, is wide and deep. And there's and, and research we go into, um, many bucks breeding, many does. The genetic pool is wide. You're not going to affect it. It's like literally taking one cup of fresh water and dumping it into the ocean and trying to change salinity. You know, uh, you, you, you got to keep in mind too that a large proportion of the bucks on your property were not born there. That's right. They are dispersers. They disperse either you know at, as as button bucks, or they disperse at a year and a half age, mostly at a year and a half year old. And they're brand new deer. They're carrying the genetics from somewhere else where you weren't calling. Yeah. So it's way more complex than hunters want to appreciate. And what you definitely don't want to do on a property. And this is my last comment on this subject, but, but I think it's an important one. Be careful when you open up the, quote, coal buck opportunity on a property because it will be abused. And it's an excuse for hunters to shoot bucks. In many cases, I would say most that shouldn't be shot. So if, if, if I was with a hunting club, I would say only these three deer. You know, I would, I would not, not give them unlimited parameters to shoot coal bucks. I would say, hey, we've identified these three that we've got two years on now. We've seen some, some, you know, these. If you see one of these three or one this one buck or whatever, you can take him. But open it up wide, you're going to see too many deer come to the skin and shed. I've, I've, I've seen it, where a guy brought in a deer with a broken main beam. Other side normal, broken main beam. It's a cull. No, no, that's not right. a cull. Um, so, you know, in, in today's world with cameras, we've got pictures of most deer on a property and stuff. I mean, you can come up with a, a photo album for them and say, these are the deer that are takers. Yeah. And it makes it easy for them at that point. Yeah. But you have to have somebody that's making the call. Mm. 